Hello everyone, this is David from Automotive Press. Today, I want to talk about the economics of car buying as an automotive engineer because I have a different perspective in terms of what to buy, when to buy, and when to sell them to minimize the cost of running my business, which is a consulting engineer business I own. So I have, uh, in addition to uh, two cars that I own, several cars in my company fleet and they have to be changed over every so uh, so many years so I have to find a way to reduce my cost so even though I have an engineering background what I do in business is actually mostly to do with strategy and so this is a very interesting supply and demand strategy work that sometimes I teach in my classes and this is quite different from your normal supply and demand curve that you might see or hear about in let's say a typical business class so let me walk you through this process and explain to you so that you can perhaps learn from this methodology or this thinking and therefore lower your cost of buying or selling your cars and trucks. So here's a very simple supply and demand curve. A little bit different in auto industry though. So it's not quite the same as what you learn in let's say MBA class. Now just before you begin to question me about my background, I do have a mechanical engineering degree, but I have a postgraduate degree in business and strategy from Harvard Business School in Boston. And I uh, teach and practice uh, business strategy. So I do have a background in this field as well. Uh, but here's the explanation. As most of you probably know, it's all about the demand and supply curve. So uh, in the new model introduction, when the car company introduce a new truck or car, there's always a lot of hype, a lot of interest, and therefore a lot of demand. And the car companies know this, which is why they would uh, introduce cars uh, as early as possible and do some previews and media reviews so that uh, people are all excited and they are ready to buy the car when it finally hits the showroom. So the demand is typically very high in the beginning, especially in the first year or so. This is the year, this is, this is the year on top. Okay, this is the demand curve. This is a supply curve. Okay, this is timeline here. So in the first year, demand is always high. It's going to shoot up. And unfortunately, uh, the supply is low because the car company is still ramping up production. Uh, in some cases, it's maybe a limited production. And so there is a huge gap between demand and supply in the first year. So many examples of this situation, such as the Chevrolet CA Corvette, which is still in demand, still high demand, and still very much short supply. And of course, the supply curve is complicated by the chip shortage, and therefore the supply curve is uh, very fluctuating up and down. And so whether it's the Corvette or the upcoming 2022 Tundra, in the first year, there are going to be a very large gap between the demand and supply, which means there will always be a shortage of that product. But in the second year, things begin to stabilize a little bit. The demand crew will begin to stabilize and it will begin to fluctuate up and down a little bit based on things like incentives. Um, but the supply curve will also go up because the manufacturer have uh, increased and ramped up the production and they have gotten all the bugs out of the system and they're able to increase the supply month after month year after year and supply and demand curve is beginning to converge. Maybe the second year or third year, typically speaking, supply and demand curve will converge. In fact, supply curve will begin to uh, exceed the demand and that's when the product begin to set longer and longer on the shelf in inventory because people aren't as interested and there's sufficient inventory to go around. So you've got this kind of typical three-year trend uh, depending, of course, on the type of car or the truck, these curve will change quite dramatically. But generally speaking, the first year is hot, second year is lukewarm, and the third year is likely not warm at all, or cold maybe even. So what I try to do in terms of managing my company fleet of cars and trucks is to try to buy and sell within this first year to year and a half when there is still a demand for such a car. And this is complete opposite to what you're hearing from any other sources, which is, don't sell your car in the first year or two years because it's depreciating the most. But well, that is only true for normal cars that are not in high demand, sort of uh, your uh, run-of-the-mill cars and trucks that you can buy anytime, anywhere with lots of inventory. Yes, they, they do depreciate substantially in the first two years. But I'm talking about more specialized models, specialized cars and trucks, such as the Supra, the Corvette, um, the upcoming Lotus Emira, 
um, the new uh, cyber truck even so these are all trucks and models that we know for sure will have a huge demand with a very low supply so my aim is always to buy something that has a tremendous demand for the first year to two years with a guaranteed short supply and I try to estimate what those uh, trend would look like and I try to put deposit on these cars or trucks that could be in high demand at least six months, sometime one year or even year and a half in advance. So that will allow me to secure the supply for me and be able to buy that car or truck really early in the game, like right around here, and then only keep it for about a year or so when the demand is still high and supply is still low, thereby there's still this huge gap right here. And while the gap is big between demand and supply, I'm going to trade in or sell my car or truck. And that way, I almost never lose money or lose very little money. Uh, and if you do a calculation based on monthly fee or depreciation, what I find is that by buying and selling cars and trucks that are in demand and doing it on a regular basis before the demand drops out, uh, well, my cost is much lower on a monthly basis. It's way cheaper than leasing that car, for example. So I've done that with multiple cars. And so mostly Toyota cars, of course, because they're always in demand, especially for TRD Pros. And so that's why I've owned a number of Tacoma TRD Pros. I'm about to buy the Tundra TRD Pro. And I bought the GR Supra also thinking that uh, I can play the same game. Well, that's the only one I kind of made a mistake or rather uh, unexpected uh, thing happened, which is right after I bought the Supra, the pandemic and COVID hit. And so demand died right away. And by the time demand began to come up again, well, the Corvette came up and other interesting models such as Nissan Z or Nissan Z also being announced. So um, all these models came out and therefore the demand for Supra kind of died down. It's still in somewhat demand, but I'm not going to be able to get the money back as much as I thought. But the Tacoma TRD Pro, which I traded in a while back, I didn't lose any money. And I know that uh, the two Toyota RAV4 Primes we just purchased last six months, they're not going to depreciate either. There is like a two year waiting list. So these are the models I'm going to be able to sell again, even uh, six months or a year later, and most likely not lose any money. So you have to kind of plan this ahead. Try to figure out a car or truck that is going to be in demand for first year to two years, knowing that supply will be very limited, work backwards, and then put a deposit about six months in advance so that you were the first one or one of the first one to buy it. And so you can keep it for a short time, year or maybe year and a half and sell it while there is a huge demand for that model, thereby ensuring that one is easy to sell, two, you probably won't lose much money or no money at all. And so that's sort of the strategy I've always used and that's how I run my company fleet, which is why uh, I put deposit on the RAV4 Prime almost a year and a half ago. Uh, why I have placed deposit in so many other new models coming up uh, very early and that includes everything from Tesla Cybertruck to the Ford F-150 electric truck. So this is the sort of business strategy I apply to my, uh, my fleet of cars I have. Um, now I do apply the same principle to a personal car I own. So Tacoma TRD Pro is my daily driver, it's my company car. And then the Toyota Supra is my personal car, so that's uh, personally owned. So I have the same strategy I'm going to apply for both. So for example, the Tacoma TRD Pro is going to be traded in for the Tundra TRD Pro this coming fall or early next year. I know I'm not going to lose money on my current Tacoma TRD Pro and I know I will probably not lose money on the Tundra TRD Pro. And on the Supra, I'm still deciding what to do with it. It's holding pretty good value. It has depreciated a little bit uh, because of the uh, other sports car that came out like Corvette. But I have now placed a deposit on Lotus Emera uh, and uh, Porsche 718 Cayman GTS 4.0 uh, because both of those two cars are in super high demand and the supply is expected to be super low for many years to come. So it's a bit of a stretch for me to go from Supra to those uh, higher end uh, models. But I know if I can make that stretch, I can keep one of those cars, not both obviously, but one of those cars and a few years down the road, I can probably sell it and not lose any money. So it's a bit of a gamble on that one because it's a lot more money than I want to spend. Uh, but on the Tacoma to Tundra upgrade, that's a no-brainer. I know that uh, I won't lose money on my Tacoma TRD Pro 
and I know that the Tundra TRD Pro will keep a good value for quite a few years to come. So it's kind of like looking at the entire car buying and selling process in much the same way you look at stocks, right, which goes up and down and it also can be risky. But if you play the game right, you will be surprised how well you can do. So I hope this ha helped you a little bit in terms of understanding why I put so much deposit and what kind of strategy I have to try to minimize cost. By the way, people did ask me about deposit. What does that mean? How could you possibly put deposit in a car that is not out for a year? Uh, so for example, I just placed a deposit for 2023 Toyota 4Runner. So what it is basically is that the deposit just gives you the right to be the first person to buy that car or truck. It's not an actual deposit for an order. It's a deposit to give you the right. Here in Canada, we can uh, put deposit really early and they are defundable by law. So um, we just have to put a deposit, put your name on it, and they put your name basically on the first of the list. So you have the first right of refusal in terms of uh, picking and buying that particular vehicle. Obviously, uh, when you go to the US, the law is different. And depending on which dealers you go, they will say, hey, you can't put a deposit because car is not announced yet. Well, what you tell them to do is, look, I just want to place a deposit so that I have the right to put another deposit to order the car or truck when it's finally available to order. But until then, could you, could you, you know, take my whatever, $500 deposit, maybe even a couple hundred dollar deposit, just to have my name on top of the list and so that I'm the first person to be called when the car or truck is announced and I can officially then order and place the normal deposit. So that's the sort of the approach you have to take. And by doing so, you can hold the car in your name a year in advance, maybe even a year and a half in advance. And you just want to make sure though that you have something in writing that says that deposit, the initial deposit is fully refundable um, based on you looking at the car or truck when it's announced, right? So subject to viewing. And that way you can get it fully refunded. Again, here in Canada and also in British Columbia where I live, uh, the law is such that they have to fully refund the deposit if I change my mind. So we're protected here, but it's different in the US. So those are something to think about. Uh, what do you think? Let me know in the comments below uh, what your thoughts are on this uh, kind of business strategy applied to car buying. Obviously, it's a lot more complicated than this graph indicate, and there's a lot more to this than what I can explain to you in this short time. But I want to give you a bit of a glimpse of what I do in terms of car buying and selling. Thank you for watching. Talk to you soon again. Uh, we'll stay in touch. Mm -hmm.